Hello, we're back again with some probability um, exercises and investigations. And up to this point, we've been doing some relatively straightforward probabilities. And I want to get into something that may be a little bit more challenging for us. Some things that maybe turn out to have multi-stage probabilities. And along the way, we're going to introduce a, a technique called probability trees to help us look at that. But before we get into this too much, I want to do a particular experiment and look at rolling a pair of dice. Now, remember a random variable assigns a unique number to each event from a sample space. And notice that these events are not necessarily simple events, nor are they automatically equally likely. But a discrete probability distribution function, or, or probability density function, PDF, assigns a probability to each value of the random variable. And the sum of those probability values for the PDF for, for all possible values of the random variable must be 1. Now notice that the random variable represents the output from a function from the set of events to set of real numbers, but it's the input of the probability distribu distribution function. So we're going to think of it mainly as the input. So let's take a very simple experiment here. Let's start with rolling a single standard fair die and let the random variable x be the number of dots on the top face. Now what I'd like you to do is start by making a table of all the possible values that x can take on and then what their probabilities. In other words, that is a PDF table. And then make a graph of the PDF, which is a bar graph, of those probabilities. I don't think this is a very hard exercise for you to do. Why don't you go ahead and do that right now. Press pause. Well, is this what you came up with? The values of the random variable are either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And each of those has the exact same probability, equally likely. So the probability of each one is 1, 6. Notice those add up to 1. And so when you graph that, you get a bar graph where all the bars are exactly the same height. This would be an example of a discrete uniform distribution, all of them the same height. Well, that was pretty easy, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody, I think everybody got that one, hopefully. Now, let's look at what's coming next. Suppose I just make it a little more interesting. Suppose this time, instead of rolling one die, I roll a pair of dice. And this time, the random variable x will be the sum of the total number of dots on the top faces. In other words, here we rolled a 6 and a 4, so the total number of dots is 10. So basically add up the two dice together, and that will give you the, uh, the, the random variable x. Everybody with me? Okay, so the first question is, what possible values could the random variable take on? So let's see if we can, can maybe take a look at that first. Okay, and see, see what we can, can do with that. Okay, and then we want it to, uh, once we have that, we want to try to make probabilities for each of those. So let's say in specifically, what's the probability roll of 5? Okay, so what are the possibilities first of all? What are the values that x can take on? Well hopefully you realized it's going to be either 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. Uh, notice you can't roll a 1 or a 0 or a 2 and a half or a 13. Uh, these are the only ones that are possible. possible. So we have the list of all our values of x. What are the probabilities that go with each of them? So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to think about this a little while. This may require a little bit of thought. So you may have to pause this and think a little bit. And I want you to come up with what you think the probability is uh, for each of these. And specifically what the probability is, say, for rolling a 5. Okay? So think about that and come back when you think you have an answer. Press pause now. Okay, so let's we want to try to fill out all these probabilities. Okay, the first thing is we know that those probabilities have to be what? Numbers between 0 and 1 inclusive. And in, in fact, we know none of them are 0 and 1. So there's something between 0 and 1. And uh, they all have to add up to 1. So we know that. 
Uh, but what are those probabilities? And specifically, which one would go right here? What's the probability of five? What did you come up with? Well, I asked my class this uh, a recent semester, and I got a bunch of different answers. So what's the probability of a row of five? Well, I got one twelfth, I got one eleventh, I got one ninth, one eighth, one seventh, one sixth, one fifth, one fourth, one third. Um, some of these I got other things that weren't reduced that reduced to one of these. Um, I got all kinds of answers. So what's going on here? Well, when you roll one die, what's the probability of a five? Well, it's just one six. Everybody got that. That was easy. What about this one? Maybe not so obvious, right? Uh, maybe you got it right. Maybe you didn't. Uh, but certainly my whole class didn't get it right. In fact, I had a class of 20 when I did this, and there was only two students out of the 20 that got it right. So the right answer is up there. But uh, maybe we still don't quite know which, what it is. So the idea of probability is easy, but the idea of counting up maybe is not quite so easy. So counting is kind of hard. Probability is pretty easy, but counting is kind of hard. So um, how could we how could we estimate get an estimate of what the probability would be? How can we look at these and see if any of these are just completely unreasonable or which ones are reasonable? Well, one thing we might do is find an empirical probability, or ex remember that we get that from an experiment, from a simulation. So actually get out a pair of fair dice. So, so actually find you some dice and actually roll them. Roll the pair of dice, find the sum, and just put a tally mark. If you roll a, a 10, put a mark by the 10. The next time you roll a 7, put a mark by the 7. You roll another 10, put a mark by that, and so forth. And just do this, but roll the pair of dice a hundred times and record your results. Now, if you can't find a pair of dice, uh, there's a probability simulator on a TI-84 that you could make work for you. I have another video on how that works. and Or you can find some probability simulators uh, online, too, to help generate dice rolls. But actually perform this experiment yourself a hundred times. So that's a hundred pair of dice, a hundred different X values, and do a relative frequency table. And that relative frequency table should be not the same as, but close to uh, the actual probabilities. So those relative frequencies are what we call empirical probabilities. So go ahead and do this now, and then let's look back and see if see if you think your answer you came up with, with for a probability of five, or just the probability for each one in general, is reasonable based on the the experiment that you just did. Okay, it's going to take a minute for you to do this, so press pause and come back when you're done. Press pause now. Well, I did this with a class of students. Actually, I did this with several class of students. And collectively, uh, I got my students to roll a pair of dice 700 times, and I collected the data. And you'll see here that 13 times they rolled a 2, 39 times a 3, 67 times a 5, uh, 112 times a 7, and so forth, 21 times a 4, 12. Did you expect all these bars to be the same height, or did you expect that something that looked like this, where the bars are higher in the middle, and they got kind of smaller as you went out to the right and left? A little more mound-shaped. Hmm. Well, it appears that that maybe should be the case, because that's what came out experimentally. Does that make sense? And does the table you came up with have, have uh, probabilities that are higher in the middle and lower on the ends? Does that even make sense? We'll come back to that in a minute. So if you look, this experimental probability was 9.57. That's, that's only 700 times, which in, in a way is not that many times. But it, it's, it's given us a, a pretty good estimate, maybe, of about 9.57. Now look at these numbers up here. Which ones of these are you know, maybe in the right ballpark, and which ones are just, just definitely just don't look right? Well, uh, 9.57% 9 uh, 9 is pretty close to 9.1%. It's not too far off of 11.1%. Uh, those look like the most likely candidates. Maybe this 1 12th or 1 8th are close, 
But I would say this one seventh, one sixth, one fifth, one fourth, one third are pretty unlikely for it to be that big based on our experimental probability. So we still haven't figured out what the actual probability is, but we have some idea that the probability should be higher for those numbers in the middle, like 7 and 6 and 8, and lower for numbers like 2 and 12. And we also think that, that the probability 5 should be in that you know 10% range, somewhere close to that. So let's keep thinking about this a little bit. All right, so once again, this is our table of x values. Okay, now what we've seen is, is that the idea of probability is easy, but counting is harder. So we need to find a way to count this up. And the problem is each one of these is not equally likely. If you put 1 11th for each one of those, that would be the probability if they were all equally likely. But we kind of see from our experimental data that that's not true. Well, why, why is that the case? Well, how many ways can we roll a 2? Well, you may have said, you should have said just one way. The only way you can do it is both of the dice have to be 1s. All right, how many ways can we roll a 12? Well, that's also one way. Both dice have to be on a six. All right, how about a three? Well, the dice have to be a one and a two. So now the question is, does that count as two possibilities or only one? Is a one and a two different than a two and a one? Well, the question is, can you physically turn the dice and still get a 2 and a 1? And yes, you can. You can take the 1, turn it to a 2, and the 2, turn it to a 1, and you've got a different arrangement of dice, and that turns out to be still a 3. So, there actually, it does count as two possibilities. In fact, you could think of it this way, as the dice being two different colors. And whether or not they're actually two different colors doesn't really matter. But let's say we have a white die and a red die. And we could get a 1 on the white die, 2 on the red, and it's different to get a 2 on the white die and a 1 on the red. So there are two ways of rolling a 3, a 1, 2, and a 2, 1. How about a 4? Did you come up with two ways, three ways, four ways? Well, there's actually three ways. You can have a 1 and a 3, and a 3 and a 1, and a 2 and 2. Now notice reversing 1 and 3 to get 3, 1, you can actually do that by physically changing both dice. But a 2, 2 only counts once because we can't physically change them and still get a 2, 2. So that's actually, uh, 2, 2 only counts once, but a 1 and a 3 counts twice, 1, 3 and 3, 1. So there's a total of three ways that you can get a 4. How many ways do you think you get a 5? This is the, kind of the one we were checking on. How many ways can you get different rolls all together? How many total rolls are there? Well, the sample space actually has 36 equally likely outcomes. There are six choices for the first die. You can turn it one of six ways. And for every one you turn there, like we put the first die on a one, then, then we have a one and a one, a one and two, one and three, one and four, one and five, one and six. Then we turn the first die to a two, and the second die can be either the one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's a total of six choices for the second die for every one for the first tie. So that's six times six or 36 possible rolls. And in fact, here they all are. There's all 36 rolls and they're kind of in an organized pattern, right? If you can kind of look at it, you can see. Now, what's the sum here? Well, this one's two. These two add up to three. These three add up to four. There are four fives, five sixes, six sevens right along this diagonal. But now it starts to go down. There are only uh, one, two, three, four, five eights, one, two, three, four nines, three tens, two elevens, and one twelve. So if I kind of regroup those, 
they look like this. There's the one, there's the first one, only one way to get a two, two ways to get a three, three to get a four, four to get a five, five to get five ways to get a six. Whoops. Six ways to get a seven, uh, and so forth. Now, we see again that there are a total of 36 rolls, so now we can count things up. So the probability that we roll a 2 is 136. Probability of a 3 is 3, 236. Probability of 4 is 336. Probability of 5 is 436. 536 for a 6. 636 for a 7. Then it starts going back down. 536 again for an 8. 436 for a 9, and so forth. And if we graph those, some of these would, would reduce, like uh, 236 reduces to 1 18th, 336 reduces to 1 12th, and so forth. And a 5 was actually 436 or 1 9th. Okay, so the actual value is 1 9th for the probability of a 5 that we were looking at earlier. And here is the actual probabilities. Here they are in reduced fraction form, exact values, approximately in decimal uh, percent form, actually. And so you, hear, you see here the percentages kind of given here as approximations. And here we're going to compare it kind of side by side or on top of each other to our, our uh, empirical probability that I got with my sample data. And you might have got a slightly different bar graph on yours. So the sample frequency histograms on the bottom the actual theoretical one, the real probability, is the one on the top. So you see those purple bars are the actual probabilities, and they're perfectly symmetric about the 7. And if you look, though, we got fairly close to that for our histogram when we did um, 700 samples. Okay, so there's an example. This DICE experiment's a classic one, very easy. So notice it's interesting that rolling one die was extremely easy. Everybody could get the probability of that. But just a simple little twist of rolling two dice turned out to be a little harder to count up. So we need to wait, be careful about this and see if we can be very careful about how we count our events. you got to be sure that you're counting things that are equally likely to happen to be able to come up with the right probability. We're going to learn a technique that's going to help us with this it's called a probability tree, and we're going to come to that in our next video.